Well, today is Grandparents' Day, and so I direct your attention to Genesis 48 and one verse that um, Brother Colson read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, is the chapter of the Hall of Faith. It says, here are some things that people did by faith. Abel, he offered a more excellent sacrifice. Enoch, he walked with God. Noah, he worked for God. He built an ark. You know why he built the ark? Because God told him to. Do you know why Abel killed a lamb, one of his lambs? Because God told him to. Do you know why that Enoch walked with God? Because God invited him to do so. And then he says, Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees. He left a beautiful home, no doubt, to go on a lifelong camping trip living in a tent the rest of his life. And every time someone would ask him, why are you doing this? He would say, because God told me to. And by the way, that's what faith is. Faith is trusting God enough to obey him, to do what he asks us to do. And then his son, Isaac, also uh, followed his dad and stayed on that camping trip looking for a city whose builder and maker was God and and build digged wells. He was known for his work. And then the Bible says, and Jacob, who when he was dying, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed his children's children. He blessed Joseph's boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. And he worshiped the Lord, leaning upon his cane or his staff. And I thought that would be a kind of interesting thing, just to, of, of all things that grandparents would do in the Bible, there are numerous grandparents in the Bible. Timothy was very much influenced by his grandmother Lois, uh, who definitely loved him and invested in him, and thank God for godly grandmothers. But in the Bible here today, we find that Jacob, by faith, he blessed his grandchildren. And he worshiped the Lord, leaning upon his staff. And then we go back to Genesis chapter 48, where we were this morning. And it gives the account, the whole chapter of Genesis 48 gives the account of Jacob honoring and, and blessing his two grandchildren, sons of Joseph. I don't have time to go through the whole chapter, though I wish I did, but I do want to make some points out together with you this morning. And by the way, I think all five things I get to say today, my five points, are very applicable to grandparents. But truly, they're very applicable to every single individual here, even if you're six or seven years old. If you're a teenager, these points can help us. But we do see something, an example, by faith, Jacob did this, and it's by faith that every grandparent should provide this for their grandchildren, and every parent should provide this for their children, and every individual should provide this for those around us today. Look, if you would please, at Genesis chapter 48. The Bible says, And it came to pass that after these things, that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Just real quickly, uh, the background here, Jacob was the son of, of Isaac, and Jacob had 12 children, 12 boys and one girl, her, her name was Dinah. He did not have them from the same woman, it was a very dysfunctional home which created lots of challenges in Jacob's life. The name Jacob means a deceiver or a trickster or a liar, someone who gets one over on someone else. And God changed his name from Jacob later to Israel, a prince with God. But Jacob had had a really, because of his own deceit and his own problems, he really complicated his life. And those of us who sin can testify the same thing. Sin complicates our life. But God had been merciful to him because in Genesis chapter 28, he had met face to face with Jesus Christ incarnate. A Christophany. He met and wrestled with the God of heaven and his son, Jesus Christ. And he became face to face with him and he met him and he accepted him and his promise. That God would not just bless Abraham and Isaac, but God would bless him. 
He was a faithful tither. He chose. He said, Lord, whatever you give me, I will give back a tithe to you. He made that promise. He was someone who wasn't perfect. Matter of fact, he was a stinker. To some places, I don't like Jacob. He was a whiner and complainer and a blame thrower oftentimes. He was conniving, in, but he was someone who in the crevices of his mind and his heart, he had an appetite for God. He loved the Lord, and God saw that. His brother Esau had no interest in spiritual things. He despised his, his spiritual responsibility in his home. He despised his birthright. He became a very uh, perverse man who sought repentance and didn't find his repentance. But Jacob was someone who God had definitely got his attention. He had accepted the promise of the Lord Jesus personally at Bethel or Luz. Now, though, time has gone up by. And now everyone is assembled in Goshen in Egypt. And they're there together, and they came with just 70 souls, 70 members of the family. And, J and Jacob is there, who's now Israel, and he has all of his 12 sons there, including Joseph, who's the prime minister of Egypt at the time. Joseph has found them a wonderful place for them to raise their families and, and take care of their flocks and in a beautiful place of Egypt. I was just in Egypt last week and I asked several people the question, what part of Egypt is Goshen? And it seems like to me no one really knows for sure. They gave me different answers. But wherever it was, it was a very fertile area. It was a good place. But in the process, Jacob is aging and getting ready to die, and someone tells Joseph in the palace, your dad's pretty sick. And his dad, and he said, your dad's pretty sick. And so jo Jacob, Joseph, excuse me, gets Manasseh and Ephraim, his two boys, who are probably not little children at this time. They're probably 20, 21, 22, maybe 24 years old at the time. And he gets his sons and said, we've got to go see grandfather. I don't know if he gets in one of the royal chariots or the steeds or what have you, but they make their way out to Goshen. And someone tells, ja tells Jacob, Jacob, Joseph's here with the boys. I want you to notice something that says here, if you would please, in verse number 2. And the Bible says, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel, would you read the next two words, and sat upon, and sat upon the bed. We find here that Joseph now visits dad and someone says, hey, sir, your son Joseph. And remember, Joseph was a treasured son for Jacob. His mom and dad were very partial and he was very partial, made no bones about it. J Joseph was his favorite. He had one other son named Benjamin who was born after Joseph and in that, in that birth, it, Rachel dies and and so he raises Benjamin as a single father. But he loved Joseph. And the Bible says that whenever he heard that Joseph was there with his two grandsons, who were both born in Egypt, that he strengthened himself. He was very sick, probably nigh unto death. But he got enough strength within himself to greet and to meet those who had visited him. I'd like to just say to you this morning, the first thing I want to share with you is everybody needs to be strengthened to help somebody else. You've got to strengthen yourself. Every, every grandson ought to have a grandfather and every granddaughter ought to have a grandfather and a grandmother who is strong spiritually. Now, I think it's good to be strong physically. I think we ought to take care of ourselves. We ought to watch our, our exercises, our diets. We ought to watch our health and do what we can to live as long as we can to influence those around us. But here we find that Jacob strengthened himself. I thank God for people who are remaining teachable, who read the Word of God, who attend church, who grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, who take a discipleship lesson or help someone else in the discipleship lesson. A need to continue to strengthen yourself. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, my prayer for the church is that they would be strengthened with God's might by His Spirit, where? In the inner man. To be strong, in the, it takes inner man strength to live the Christian life. That's why so many don't. 
It takes inner man's strength to memorize and study the Bible. That's why people don't do that. It takes inner man's strength to evaluate what God has blessed you with and then divide it by 10 and return 10% back to the Lord. It takes faith to do that. But Jacob had the faith to strengthen himself. I want to say to you, whether you are single or married, whether you're a grandfather or a grandchild, whether you're a grandmother, whether you're a single adult, somebody depends upon your willingness to strengthen yourself. Weakened people are not a help to those around them. Weak teenagers hurt their parents, hurt their siblings. A weakened young person who's not strong, it takes inner man's strength to obey and honor your mom and dad. And if you don't do it, you're not only hurting yourself, you're hurting your siblings. When you and I do not respond to our parents the way we ought to do that. I would like to say, number one, strengthen yourself. Do not be a spiritual weakling. Number two, I want to show you the next thought that comes to my mind here. In verse number three, the Bible tells us this, and, and Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of the Canaan and blessed me. I want you to notice the second thing I think would be very good for us to do, not only strengthen ourselves, but to speak with our posterity and others about the time that you met Jesus Christ. When he got Joseph and the boys there, he said, let me tell you about what happened to me when I met God. And he actually met Jesus that day. In the land, if you go back and read Genesis chapter 28, it was a Christophany. It was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And you know, at this time, it's beautiful to me, is that he didn't get too many words out of his mouth. As a matter of fact, the first thing he told them, let me tell you about when I met Jesus. Do your grandchildren know when you met Jesus and when Jesus took your sin? Do they know, do your parents know that about you, young person? Do your Do your kids know from you when I got saved? I hope you're not embarrassed by this, or I hope I never cause anything, but when I I do funerals and have a joy to help families through funerals, it always blesses me when everyone knows when they got saved. It always hurts me when I say, when did mom get saved? Oh, yeah, it's been a long time ago. I I don't even know. I maybe could look in the Bible or something. When did Grandpa get saved? You know, I'm sure he was young. No, don't don't tell me that. Tell me when that they got saved. You ought to know the testimonies, and your kids ought to know your testimony, and your grandchildren ought to know. And he says here at the last few hours of his life when he has his two grandsons and his sons there, he said, remember when I met uh, the, uh, the Almighty God there in Luz or Bethel. And he told them about when He met the Lord. Dear friend, I want to encourage you. If your kids don't know when you got saved, tell them today. If your mom and dad don't know when you got saved, you ought to be able to tell them, here's when I accepted Jesus Christ. By the way, not just to your posterity, but to anyone around you. Tell your testimony of what God did to bring you to the Almighty God. That's the most wonderful day in someone's life. And let me just pause and say parenthetically, maybe you're here today and you're not sure when that happened for you. Maybe you don't share your testimony because you don't have one. And that's not an embarrassment. That's, it's not bad to not have a testimony. It's bad to stay that way. Maybe if I ask you today, let me just pretend if we were sitting across the table and I said to you, tell me what God did to bring you to Christ. Tell me when it was. Tell me what it was like. Could you be able to articulate that to me? You say, Pastor, I, I think I would struggle with that. Could I encourage you not to leave today until you let someone explain to you, today could be your day of salvation. Everybody needs a time and a place when you believe and receive Jesus Christ. That's when you meet the Almighty God on His terms. And you accept by faith His gift of eternal life. If you're here and you're not sure about that, be sure that you know that. And if you are sure about that, verbalize that. Tell your husband, tell your wife, tell your friends at work, tell your children, your grandchildren, and if you can't tell them when, because there's not been a time, let someone explain that and make this October the 26th, is it 26th today? 
20, what? 23rd, I'm sorry. October 23rd. Make this your day of salvation. Don't make the 26th. That's, that's waiting till then. Don't do that. Do it today. And say, you know what? I am going to nail this down. I'm going to go tell my grandchildren when and where that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Number two, speak and share with your posterity times when you met Jesus. Number three, we see here, we ought to look at verse number four, if you would. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make unto thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make thee a multitude of people, and will give thee this land to thy seed after thee for an eternal or an everlasting habitation. I want to, the third thing I want to encourage you to do, number one, strengthen yourself spiritually. Number two, share with others your testimony of salvation. Number three, talk about the goodness of God. Speak about how good God has been to you. You know, there's a temptation when you're older to get to a complaining state. I really have a beef against Jacob in this way because Jacob, whenever his dad or his son, Joseph, brought him into Egypt and he brought him before the Pharaoh and he said, tell me about your life. And he goes, oh, it's been rough. It's been hard to be me. I want to say, you idiot. Don't complain before an unsaved man how hard it is to be you. My years have been long and gregarious. It's been awful. No. God's people ought to be the happiest people in the world. We ought to count our blessings, name them one by one. I want to encourage you to share not only your blessings, but your burdens and the difficult times you went through and what God did to do that for you, how he helped you through that. When you get with your grandkids, it's all right to talk about sports. It's all right to talk about this thing and that thing. But talk to them about spiritually. Let me tell you some things that God did for me in my life. And tell the grandchildren and tell the children and tell your friends, here are some things that God has done for me. And when Jacob, when he was just minutes and hours and maybe a few days from death, he strengthened himself. He told of when he got saved. And then he told of God's goodness and his blessing in his life. Later on, he'll tell the boys, and we don't have time to look at it this morning, but he tells the boys about when his, when their, his mother died, their grandmother died. He said, we were in, in Pandoran, and there my wife Rachel passed away. Your grandmother, she passed away. And we buried her there in Bethlehem. And uh, she's, she's there. And, but I'm sure he told them, God helped me through that difficult time. Oh, I miss her so much. And I wish I could have had her back, but the Lord strengthened me through that time. Tell them about the good times that God's been good to you. Tell them about the tough times that God has preserved and helped and met the needs that God's given you. Once again, if you don't have those times, get them. But we'll say the next thing I will share with you is stimulate others in the eternal perspectives. Look, if you would, please, at the last few words of verse number four. And after thee for an everlasting possession. Here, what the Bible says, he says, you know, God not only promised me to have a good life now, but he promised me to have an everlasting possession. Grandparents, mature Christians, you should spend some time every time you talk to people about the everlasting possession. The Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. I, I kind of want to just uh, throw up sometimes when I think about how we're so consumed about the nasty now and now. Can I remind you, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. But we need to talk about our future. Talk about eternity. Set our affections on things. What will matter when you have a decision to make and your grandchildren ask you, what should I do? You ought to ask themselves, what would you be most glad you did when you stand before Jesus one day? What would be the right thing to do? Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. I think as this old man sat in front of his two grandsons and, and his son, 
He strengthened himself for the visit. He showed them and told them of his salvation testimony. He told them about the good things that God had done for him. He shares the heartaches that God had brought him through. And then he tells them about an everlasting possession. That life is more than about the next buck and the next toy and the next career and the next house and the next car. It's about eternity. It's about one day standing before Jesus Christ. I think so many of us talk too much about nasty now and now and very little about eternity future. But he said, you know, I want to tell you, there's life after this. And as Hosea said, prepare to meet thy God. We ought to think about eternity. There's two days you ought to concentrate on oftentimes. Number one is today. Yesterday is a counseled note. Tomorrow is a promissory note. It's a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Today is spending cash. You don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. The Bible says, boast not thyself. And if you're waiting to get saved until another time, don't wait. If you were to ask God when he wants you to get saved, he'd say, now is the day of salvation. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Don't put that off. But we also, we ought to remind ourselves too, there's another day we ought to think about today and that day when we stand before God. We ought to be concentrating oftentimes on what's going to be like when I roll into the judgment seat of Christ. When I am ushered in before the Lord Jesus Christ and have to give an account of the deeds done while in my body. I think oftentimes we don't talk about that because we're so consumed with television. We're so consumed with bills and problems and difficulties and possessions rather than the eternal prospects. The last thing I think he shared with them, not only strengthened himself, he shared with them his testimony. He spoke of the blessings and burdens that God had given and brought him through. He stimulated his grandchildren and his son to consider the eternal. And then last, we ought to seek to be in the presence and show affection to our children. I want you to show this real quick. This is primarily just for our, our grandparents. But look, if you would, please, at verse number 9. And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age. He was struggling with his eyesight, just like his father Isaac, so that he could not see. But notice what he did. He brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And then Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought that I would see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed or thy children. Grandparents, let me encourage you. Bring your children in, your grandchildren close to you. He said, bring them unto me. Draw them near unto me. Spend time with your grandchildren and invest spiritual investments in their life. Number two, be affectionate. You know, every child needs three things. They need affection, direction, and correction. But their main need is affection. Most every child, if they know they're loved, and that is confirmed in their hearts and lives, they, they, they will do pretty well. It's hard for a child to know his love when he doesn't know his dad. Or he's not sure... If he, where he's going to be. And, and a, a mother, a godly mother, what a blessed thing a child has. But whenever there's a strained relationship with a father, it's hard. The devil's successful in getting that child to feel like he's not as, as special as other kids. But learning to love a child, give affection, and then give direction. And then, and then you have to give correction. If you don't correct your child, the Bible says you hate your son. But whoso loveth his child, chasing him early on, he'll discipline him. But may I encourage grandparents, bring them near to you and give them affection and attention. Most children need desperately someone to love them and to give them the attention that they need. May God help us with these matters. Let's pray together. Thank you for listening. You've been such a good group today to speak to. Thank you for enjoying the Grandparents' Day with us.